So, uh, everyone give them a warm welcome. So, we're going to try, I'm going to try, we have this microphone that we're going to have to pass around, so I'm also going to try to project a little bit, so, um, just so you all know. But anyway, so thanks everyone for coming tonight. I am just like, my heart is bursting right now at the amazing turnout, some familiar faces, some so not, and so many women in the audience. I'm just like, yeah, that's I'm just beating right now. Anyway, moving on, but we're here to meet some amazing women I think are amazing, and I know that most of you all do too, that are going to talk about their experience in free and open source software. And um, we're going to start off with them introducing themselves, telling their name, and where they currently work, and what you do, and we start working in open source. So we're going to start here with Miss Karen Tracy. I work at a small website development company named Cactus Consulting Group. It's in Carborough and we're moving to Durham. Um, I've worked there for about four years. I got involved in the Django open source framework about back in 2007, I think. I became a core committer in 2008, so I um, have been involved in that for that long. What else was I supposed to say? You are supposed to say, when did you start working in open source? 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. uh, so did I cover everything? Yes. Okay. <laughs> 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 I can feel a squeal coming out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Sandy Metz. I am self-employed now. I worked for Duke University for many years, writing uh, object-oriented software. And then I wrote a book, and it was like a bomb went off in my life. So now I'm deeply embedded in the Ruby world, the open source Ruby world. I'm, uh, I teach, I travel, talk, teach, consult for a living. I finally caved and bought the CD. You can now reach me at Sandy at SandyMets.com. Okay, isn't that weird? <laughs> Gave it up and did it, yeah. So I'm completely self-employed. Oh, I didn't, I didn't answer the other questions, but you'll figure it out. Yeah. Hi. Hi, my name is Andrea Villanes. Um, I currently work here at NC State at the Institute for Advanced Analytics. Um, I am also the co-founder for Women in Technology Peru, uh, where we encourage girls to uh, start doing programming or uh, join a circle of women that are doing programming in Peru. Um, I started uh, with open source when I came to the U.S. to study my master's degree in 2008. Sorry. I'm trying to avoid horrible noises. Um, my name is Amy Hendricks. Um, I am a web engineer with a company called 10UP. Um, we are not located anywhere in particular. We're remotely located all over the world. Um, but anyway, we have a lot of fun building a lot of websites. Uh, I have been involved in open source um, primarily with WordPress for, oh, I've been involved in the WordPress community for about five years now. But I've been involved in and using open source since uh, Linux PPC in 1997. So. My name is Nora Wong. I work for Duke University on the identity management team. Where we basically uh, do um, authentication and authorization and applications that support that at the university. And let's see, I've been, um, so I don't uh, actually contribute directly to open source open source software, uh, but I've been involved with Trilog uh, since November of 2009, and I first installed Linux at home in 1997. Uh, so, yeah, so, right. Yeah, can we just 
Can you hear us? Turn Can you guys hear us? Okay, yes. back there. Okay, so we're just going to yell a lot because this is frightening. <laughs> okay, so, so the next question is, what made you want to contribute to a particular project or join a particular open source community? Or, you know, what, what made you uh, want to contribute to that particular thing in those ways? So for you, I always go first. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You want to put this in the last session? Did you notice? So I could, I could actually go because I actually didn't say anything about myself. So yeah, my name is Julia Elman. Hi. Hi. So, Hi. Hello. So I currently work as uh, one of the instructors at the Iron Yard, teaching front end development. And I, um, my first con contributions to open source were on a project called Django. Um, I started contributing and doing that in about the same time as as Karen, and uh, yeah, I love it. It's Tampa, so I in Kansas. Has anyone heard of where that? Where Django came where from? Where Django was born. So <laughs> yeah, great. Which is a Python web framework for those who don't know. Your now it's my turn. Okay. Let's see. I started contributing to Django. Um, I was using I was I was writing crosswords, freelance crosswords for submitting to the New York Times, the LA Times, the New York Sun, and I had developed this huge database of puzzles that I was using to vet themes or vet words for how good they were, and I wanted a web front end for it, so I started using Django to build a web front end for my crossword database. And when I started using it, it was before Django 1.0 came out, and they were talking about Django 1.0 coming out in any day now, which happened a couple years later. <laughs> um, and they were talking about this new forms admin branch and all the stuff that was going on there. And I got a little worried that what they were doing over there, maybe they weren't taking into account my particular needs that I was using. So I started getting involved in checking out what they were developing to make sure that they weren't going to break how I was using their stuff. Um, so that's the primary reason I thought self-interest. <laughs> I was just a programming schmuck at a day job. <laughs> I wrote code, right? That's what happened to me. And I was a small talk programmer for many years at Duke. And uh, the rates went up, and we moved to Java, which I hated. And then Ruby came out, Ruby on Rails came out. And it was my job to pick a new framework. And so, okay, we read the Rails book and we write Rails apps. And then I went to the first Rails comp and I got overheard in a hallway rant by a New York publisher. Let this be a lesson to you. <laughs> and so, yeah, and so they, so they bugged me for a while about writing a book on object-oriented design, and then finally, three years into that process, every time I saw them, they would take me out for a meal, and they would buy me an expensive meal and make me feel guilty. I mean, no, seriously, that's what happened. And then finally, she switched to this argument, the one she became my editor. She said, you use, you use open source software every day, and you don't give back. And there's no woman in the Ruby world whose name is on a hardcore technical book. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, <laughs> <laughs> And so I was a complete unknown, really, up until the point when I wrote a book. And I, I also, I, I had made no, con I, actually, that's not true. I would contributed some to open source projects, but they were just stuff I needed, right? It was the same thing. I like, needed soap for Ruby using the Microsoft, whatever that was. There, you know, some weird ass thing they did. I needed document attachments. And so I did what was necessary, but it wasn't until I wrote a book that it turned out, well, anyway, so that was a that was published a year and a half ago in September, and, and again, like I said before, it was like a long enough. I spent, I quit my job, I talk at conferences now, I do training. I, I am, so I'm much more embedded in the open source world, but not in this, like I see, I spend a lot of time with people who write open source, but I'm not, I don't contribute that much to open source projects, even though I like to think I have had a big influence on people who do, especially in the Ruby world. Like, I live in, in that world. Yeah, so. Um, so for me, um, two years ago when we founded a Women in Technology <coughs> in Peru, um, our initial thought was we are not going to start doing events where people are going to come to learn things with us and then go home and not be able to continue learning by themselves because of the, the licenses are, are too expensive or they would have to download the torrent uh, illegally. So uh, we decided then that everything that we were going to, all the events, um, actually we started with a Rails Girls event and that was 
uh, with the help of the, the help of the Ruby community. So that's why we, um, we decided that everything was going to be oriented to the open source world. So that that was like two years ago. Um, I uh, started working as a web developer way back when you had to just sort of write things in a plain text editor. And I think I posted, I, I, I think I posted an image on a website before I ever actually saw a graphical web browser and I just hoped it looked okay. <laughs> <laughs> I am not recommending this as a testing procedure by the way. I am just trying to say I'm like ancient in web terms. Um, so I was not really a technical person before that. For a long time, I didn't consider myself a programmer. I thought of it as a, sort of almost more of an extension of writing and, and so on. But I fell in love with the web because of this whole vision of it being a, a, a sort of a universally available way of publishing and getting your words and your communication out there and so on. Um, I was always really kind of frustrated at the fact that even though there was this great promise of it, of the web, that it was actually really, really hard for normal people to just pick it up and get started, unless they were stupid enough to try and post images without ever having seen them before. Um, it was an image of my dog, by the way. She was very cute. Um, uh, and so fast forward about 10 years from there, years, almost 15 years from there. Um, and I was working at Duke. I was working in instructional technology, which is more of a consulting sort of field than a building stuff field. Um, and uh, my former boss um, spearheaded a wonderful project to get an installation of WordPress that we would make available to the entire university community. Um, I was one of the three people leading that project during its pilot phase. We got it all up there, we got it started, we made a great case for why this was a much easier way and more approachable way for people without a lot of technical skills to get themselves onto the web. And I sort of fell in love with WordPress. But after our pilot semester, we found ourselves in the position of we have to launch this as an official supported university service, which means a lot of this stuff that we grabbed from here and there and figured out how to put together, we really ought to get updated and do some review and so on. Um, so over um, what was optimistically called my winter break, <laughs> I went hunting for things like test data and standards and so on that we could use to vet all of the themes and plugins we were using and make sure that they were basically ready to be launched to the wider world. I accidentally, or accidentally, I ran across in that search the WordPress theme review team, which vets all of the themes in the WordPress theme directory. There's a similar plugin review team. And I started contributing um, because I was in the middle of this giant project. I was using, using their stuff. I might as well kind of give some of it back. So I started uh, with doing code review, basically. Um, and since then, have gone on to contribute to core code, to write themes and plugins, to speak at conferences, and kind of anywhere that the WordPress community will let me stay. So when I uh, started uh, in my current position at Duke, um, I started working with a lot of uh, open source software, uh, primarily uh, written as part of the Internet 2 uh, consortium. And um, I was also working with people who were very enthusiastic about open source. And who, you know, it, I, I'd taken sort of a hiatus as far as uh, using uh, Linux at home and stuff like that. So my coworkers definitely encouraged me to get back into that and also became involved with a splat space in Durham. And met many people who were also members of Trilog. And they can, encouraged me to start attending meetings here uh, because they thought I would be interested. And I definitely was. And that was actually in 2010. I think it's important to be off by one. So, um, <laughs> um, and I definitely uh, not regretted a, a moment that I spent uh, listening to talks here and talking with, with 
fellow Carlin members here in Nevada. Cool, thank you. And for me, I've been joining open source. Uh, so I was more, I, so I met some people that, I, I was working at Hallmark Cards at the time and I met some, some people at a conference, some guys at a conference that were like, you live near Lawrence, Kansas and you're not doing Django? <laughs> <laughs> impossible like this is, it was an insult and so I was like I better do this Django thing and that's really that was really the start of my my work into open source and um, at the time you know just being really welcome into this community of learning and, uh, and and doing this learning more about being a part of open source okay so the next question is um, so in your work in open source, what are some challenges that you have faced, primarily because you you are female, that you have maybe faced in your in your career in open source? Do you want to start with me again? <laughs> <laughs> Shut your glass. <laughs> I don't know that I've had any trouble. I did think long and hard on the first mailing list post I made. I was using an email address that didn't have any indication of whether I was male or female. I did think long and hard about whether I should sign it with a name indicating I was female. Just because of the whole, everything you read, I mean, there's so many incidents that you can read about where uh, you get the distinct impression that women in programming and technical fields are looked down on or, um, thought poorly of just because they're women. So I did have some hesitation in joining the community and making it known that I was a woman, but I cannot say that I have experienced anything negative. I did sign it with my name Karen, which pretty much indicated I was female. You know, um, and I got a great response. I mean, I got a very positive response very quickly from one of the core committers and I don't know that I did anything. The whole environment around technical technology and women, I think, is very negative nowadays and kind of scary, but <coughs> personally, I have not run into anything. I kind of want to defer my time to ask you guys questions about that later. If that's all right. The one thing I would say is like, I'm a woman of a certain age, right? I'll just tell you, I'm 57. I just turned 57. So I, I've been around so long, like a long time ago when, when I started, when many of the, well, I might be this one up here. When, <laughs> like it used to be a line at the women's bathroom, right? And so by the time sort of open source came around and the, this explode, well, by the time like internet browsers appeared, right? Like something happened between the time I started and now. And I, my, the arc of my career spanned it. And now I'm like everyone's mom, right? They don't care <laughs> give me a hard time. I mean, they don't, I'm all internet famous now, right? And so, <laughs> so it, like the, but, but what I would, uh, what I want to be really careful about saying is that the problems are real. They're, they just don't happen to me. And, and it's, because of a number of things. And, I, and I, I would be more interested in hearing about your guys' experiences than telling you that I don't have a problem. So maybe we'll come back to that. I don't yep. know. It's That's not, a great idea. I'm not, um, I'm not charged. So. That's a great idea. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, so for, for, for me or for, for us, the, the most difficult challenge has been finding coaches that are women that are able to help us at the events. <laughs> so we have incredible support from the communities, and, but most of them are, are guys. So our coaches, you, you invite a Rails Girls event and, or any, any event, and then girls go and their coach is a guy. So it's okay, like we don't have any problem. Like we are very grateful for the support but it would be very interesting for, us, interesting for us to find women coaches. And even here in Raleigh, 
last year for the Rails Girls RDU, it was hard to, to find um, women coaches. So that, that's the challenge that we face. So female mentorship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd, I'll just follow on to that because actually that was my sort of biggest challenge or challenge that I see. And again, um, I feel a little almost presumptuous sort of coming and doing this panel and then getting up and saying, oh, well, I have no problems. <laughs> um, which is entirely, it's not entirely true. I mean, I haven't, and I, I don't, I, I, you know, I'm not here to tell horror stories or have, you know, huge incidents to report that cause Twitter to blow up on a weekly <laughs> basis or anything like that. But the fact that in almost any open source community, in almost any technology community, but even more so in a lot of open source tech communities, um, the fact that, that we're such a small minority makes it, I think, more difficult to even take that first step and to even start and to, to have that feeling of maybe I shouldn't sign my name. Mm -hmm. And we've all gotten past that. We've all, all, all of us up here have, have gotten involved on one level or another, but that you even have to think about, do I even want to say who I am when you're entering a new community? The fact that it is hard to find coaches, it's hard to find teachers or mentors or, you know, we having, and I think especially for people who are a, perhaps a little less likely to just kind of dive in and say, hi, I'm here, I'm gonna do six different jobs for you, um, <laughs> which is, you know, maybe its own pathology. Um, I think it's um, a lot easier, especially for people who are starting in their careers or starting their involvement to have, to, to take that step if they see visible role models or mentors or whoever that they can feel that they can approach. So I too um, don't feel like I've been, you know, had any challenges because I'm female. Um, now, for the first couple of meetings that I attended in Trilog, I was the only woman here. And I thought, well, that's odd. But it, it's not like that bothered me at all. Um, so I, I think generally throughout my career and and in uh, college before that, um, I was oblivious to any sort of discrimination that there was. I'm not saying it wasn't there, but I didn't notice. So I think <coughs> that may be in part because of, of my disability. People notice that first. Strangely enough, they worry about getting one over before they worry about whether I'm female. <laughs> um, but also, growing up with an older brother in the same field, that, I, that I'm sure made a difference. Um, I think it's a great thing. I recommend it for everyone. Um, but you know, may maybe I'll, I'll be lucky and, and have an experience in the future that's you know negative. Um, I, you know, I can always hope. Just fill in that story. Yeah. <laughs> so um, my turn. So I don't get away with not answering this right. So. Um, so one of the challenges that I've faced is really knowing when to speak up, right? Knowing when to say, hey, this, does, this makes me uncomfortable. I'm not okay with that. And, um, you know, I think that we make excuses, right? We make excuses and we say, oh, it's my fault or whatever. So even in open source, like, you know, just saying, hey, you know, I actually think something's wrong with that pull request, like even that you know, just hesitating and second guessing. So I'd say that's a big challenge for me. So even to this day, definitely. So, um, yeah, so we kind of skipped over a few questions and I, I really, and because we, we are um, almost out of time, so about how much longer do we have? Um, yeah, we can keep on doing this beat for like you know, 20 minutes or so. Uh, 
Uh, typically, we, we usually cut things off about uh, 8.30, so we still have about an hour. Okay, good. We, we, yeah, we have plenty of time. Okay, great. But I won't keep these ladies up too, yeah. too long. So, um, I really, I really like Sandy's idea a lot in making this more of a conversation. So instead of being like, look, here's women for you to see. <laughs> <laughs> They're here, we're here. So, because there's a lot of you in the audience. So um, I think it'd be great. So Sandy, so do you want to repeat sort of the idea that you had? So we're, uh, okay. Everything has been easy for me, it feels like, all my technical life. And then, 15 years ago, uh, th there, there was this big sinking, right? It used to be 50-50. There used to be a line at the women's bathroom if you went to a conference. And now when I go to Rails, Ruby conference, Rails conferences, um, at first there were 5% women. The dev, dev chicks, uh, you may not have heard of it. There's a, uh, you know, uh, it started out as Ruby, but it's broader, women software right. developers. At the first Rails comp, there were six, 600 people and 12 women. We had dinner together. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it's, it's very clear to me that if you, and I went to talks that had, they put slides that were very nearly pornographic up. And it's very clear to me that if you're not a woman of a certain age who feels like I, I'll just tell them, like, what are you thinking? Right? Like, I love those guys. I love the men in our community. I, I think that, I don't know the guys here. But, like, okay, if you're a guy, raise your hand if you think you're an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we got, we got, we got two and a half. I don't even know. I don't know. <laughs> right? It's not a gender-linked trait. But it's really clear that if you walked into that room and you felt uncertain about yourself in any way, you might turn out, you might feel like you didn't have a place in a room that had 12 women and 600 men. And so... Uh, I, I would be interested in the women here. What is your place in the world of technology? Anybody here? I'll point. I'll pick. Yeah. No. Let's well, not no? Okay. Would anyone like to? Say? I guess what would anyone say? like to Speak up. share? Oh, this is not diffuse. I will look at. I will make. Yeah. So. The, I thought you had more years than you have. Yeah. Well. I think it'll be there's easy. always one. Let's, let's do. Let's I do think, this. I think yeah. some of the stuff is not male female. Well, some I'm. Of it's just I'm Business. Right. Okay. So let's. Okay. Right. Nope. We're going to cut it off for a second because I think what would be really awesome is if we also open it to questions because I think that's going to come out from certain Whatever. people when we open it. I'm easy. Thank you. So, yes. Well, just to follow up on what Sandy's saying, mm -hmm. uh, at the ACM SIGI conference uh, last year, there was a similar panel about how do we get. Um, female students interested in comp sci because the numbers have been dwindling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It hit its high point about 1985, I think they said, where it was maybe a 60-40 mix, and it's been shrinking ever since then. And of course, those of us in education are going, "What's going on?" Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, I see that when I, you know, my advisees come and I teach business information systems, and I probably get it's probably a ratio of three to ten. Mm -hmm. And so it's obviously, to some extent, for those in ed education, it's beginning, beginning before they even get to the collegiate level. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. So what's the question exactly? Well, I, I'm just kind of, you know, she, she, she was going by kind of an uh, 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 anecdotal evidence mm -hmm. of going to conferences. I'm just saying there have been studies been made that say there's definitely a decline in terms so of. So wait, is there, a, I just want to make sure there's a, because we're, we're opening up the floor to questions. So I just okay. want to make sure there's a question. Well, Okay, but I suppose my question is, um, from your past experience, you know, what could, what could we do, those of us in education, to try to attract more women into the field? I mean, is there anything you've had from there, your, from yeah. your There's actually perspective research from on your this, experience? And I, I suck at attribution, but someone in here probably knows it. There are places where the computer science departments have changed how they teach. Harvey Mudd College. There you go. See, I knew someone would know. Okay, tell sorry, tell that? Uh, that Harvey Mudd College in Southern California. Harvey um, Mudd College. Which Sylvia is actually, I think, familiar with. Yeah, tell us about it. Um, Harvey Mudd is part of a group of colleges called the Claremont Colleges. I went to Scripps College, which is, um, shares a border with it. So um, I didn't spend a lot of time in Harvey Mudd, although I had math classes there. 
but I know that one of the things that they did to try to encourage women was to um, not, I hate to say loosen, but make it clear in their application requirements and their marketing, especially for the computer science programs, that you didn't have to come in being the person who loved computers a whole, whole bunch, or that you didn't have to come in with tons and tons of experience to be able to, um, to, to be able to keep up with the program, because they found that a lot of women had that sense of I guess imposter syndrome is the technical word for it. So maybe they had the same level of experience as a male student or just about, but they looked at this long list of requirements and they thought, oh, well, I, I only have eight of these 10, so I can't possibly take this class. Whereas somebody who felt more confident about it would say, oh, I have five of those 10, I've got it. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, that's one of the things they did to, to help with their marketing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I mean, basically the data, the, re the studies I've read talk about how they segregate people. They just put all the people that don't have much programming experience in classes together. Mm -hmm. And then they put people that have more in classes together. So you don't end up in that situation where everybody seems to know everything. I mean, like, uh, imposter syndrome is real, but I don't think this is a case of imposter syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Like, smart women go in those classes where they never get called on and they never get looked at. And they feel like an idiot and they think, hey, I could be a doctor. And they leave. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so actually, it was very really good point. Now I start remembering my career in computers. I hated computers all my life, and I thought, why would I be an engineer in my parents? How would I study languages? And then it was an interview. I got into some programs that government organized. It was in 2000, when was the first tech bubble started. And there was both a class full of women. And we started just first basic kind of um, Boolean algebra and first like basic math and we started learning C and it was maybe a little basic and I just fell in love with it. And all the women that were in the course continued being working in IT as software developers. And I just think it's not that class and I was pushed going to into this. All people around me just say, Marina, you should go and like it was and now I just realized it's not that good school of women where we started from basic, mm -hmm. where I just fell in love with program. It would not happen. Mm -hmm. so maybe it's a way to go. I think one other point that's really important with the education question, though, that I, I, a couple of us have sort of nibbled around the edges of, but um, university is way too late. Mm -hmm. Great. You know, um, and I, again, I'm kind of pulling this research out of the air because I've, I've read it and I don't have the citations and I'm bad at attribution. I'm terrible at <laughs> um, But when you look at, you know, seven, eight, nine year old kids who are doing technology camps or programs in school or games or whatever, they, they're fine with this. Boys, girls, pretty, you know, fairly equal numbers give them something presented as a good game or a good puzzle and they're good to go and they want to do it. Um, it's when girls get to around middle school age that that this isn't the thing for you force mm -hmm. starts up. And so by the time they get to college, they're already six years into that attitude of, well, those guys over there, they already know all this stuff and they've been doing this since they were 10. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be good enough for that. So by the time you've got, you mentioned you teach business information mm -hmm. systems, which sounds like university level stuff normally, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, I've worked in universities. When I teach now, it's all adult mm -hmm. classes. And these are people that have already got the idea that this isn't the thing for me. So um, there are people working with computer science education at the school level who probably could speak a lot more than I can to this. but. Getting people to keep up that interest and to stay involved, maybe having a brother is the way to do it. <laughs> I didn't have one, so I have no idea. I kind of fell into it later, but you know. Yeah. Just, oh, I'm kind of outing you. So, well, you don't just have a brother. So you have your mom and your dad. Oh, my whole family works at IBM. <laughs> so I actually, I want. Sorry, I. But I was also. I'm also old enough that it was. When I was looking for what I would do, to major in and, and you know to pursue a career, uh, 
it was the mid 70s and it was sort of women were starting to get more involved in the legal profession doctors and everything and I just saw computers as another one where it would you know go higher and it did that <laughs> and I don't know why I, but when I was entering there wasn't this it was the personal computer was just coming um, when I was in high school we had uh, the IBM PC was coming out and I we had one in my house so I was fortunate there um, but w there wasn't this culture of you know boys get involved in computers when they're really young and the girls don't and I don't know why that has developed but it is probably part of why by the time you get to college you're feeling not yeah. fair so you I feel like yeah in the back. Yes, I just wanted to go back with you for a moment about that voice. Mm -hmm. Are you saying the internal voice or the people around her saying this isn't for little girls? Some of both. Yeah. Some of both. Um, I assume there are XKCD fans in the audience somewhere. <laughs> um, my, one of my very favorite XKCD, on, or one of my very favorite comments on this whole issue of the, the, the voice in your head, the, the brain weasels, we sometimes call them. Um, but it, it is, uh, you know, it's a two panel XKCD. Somebody is, uh, you know, the, the first panel is a guy at a chalkboard making a completely egregious error in a math proof, I forget what the proof is. I'm pretty sure it's a real thing because it's, it's Randall Monroe. <laughs> and the person who's looking over his shoulder says, wow, you suck at math. <laughs> Second panel is exactly the same thing, but it's a stick figure with long hair, and the person over the shoulder is saying, god, girls suck at math. <laughs> Part of that is there is a tendency for um, Everyone here works with technology. If we're going to be honest, everyone here makes really stupid mistakes, especially when we're learning or when we're working out a problem or when we're just sort of messing around seeing what we can come up with as an approach to something. If, you, if your errors are just, hey, you know, you got a bug into this and you're going to go and fix it and improve it and continue to iterate, that's great. Mm -hmm. If you have the voice of, you stand for your entire gender and your entire gender is no good at this then you make that mistake and you say, God, they must be right. <laughs> so, and it does start yeah, to get I, I will say, I did have a professor in graduate school who was from Brazil who said women don't have the mind to do computing. Mm -hmm. I was already in electrical engineering graduate school and he excluded me. He said, except for you. He said, you're, <laughs> <laughs> he said, you're different. I mean, he allowed us how I was different, but he did flat out say that women in his country would never do or pursue the, the course I was pursuing. It can be just so as it, it can be very external. Though. Yeah. So I actually, I, I see your hand, but I wanted to a quick poll. So uh, for the women in the audience, raise your hand if you're involved in technology. So, right. So my, so we were talking about it starts at a young age, it does this, but like look at the audience, right? What percentage? would you say, you know, that's, that's a pretty large percentage. So it's been a long day. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, so what, what made other people like not stop, right? What made you not stop? That's kind of what I want to know. I mean, I know my story. Because I love what I do. That's my story. Like, that's it. So. Stubbornness? <laughs> What's that about? So I remember one of the very first tech meetups I went to the area before I joined, or before I, I was getting involved with uh, girl development and all these tech groups, I went to, it was a meetup and it was a bar and it was things we were talking about JavaScript. And I, I walked in and I went in and we were kind of talking and somebody else came in and said, oh, a group of dudes and a token girl, this must be the such and such meetup. I was like, well, great, now I feel. <laughs> and, it, the, and especially because I was very new to the community, it kind of felt like, okay, now everyone's looking at me, and I'm here to be the token girl. And because I don't mind public speaking or being looked at, I don't think that that was as bad as it could have been, but it still felt a little awkward, and I can imagine that if I were a more shy person, I would have like crawled under the table, walked out of the bar, and never come back. Mm -hmm. So like that sense of 
of being the token or the representative, or like, no, everyone's looking at me and I have to say something very important about women in computer science or they're all gonna dismiss me. I think that for me, that it was just stubbornness and uh, brashness that got me through it. But everyone is not brash or stubborn. Yeah. Like, like I want to get, like all the women that aren't in this room, how do we get them here? Like, what should we be doing? And, uh, like, I'm very interested in this issue, mm -hmm. and so I read all the research. Mm -hmm. But again, like, what are you doing? What should we be doing? Um, hi, my name's May. I'm a student in the Iron Mail. Um, Julia and Smith in here is my instructor. Um, in considering pursuing a, a programming teacher, I did a lot of reading of various articles about what it's like. Is it a welcoming environment for women? Am I going to be in a situation like I've already experienced? Back to one of the original questions where people were really insistent on telling me that I wasn't the expert and that they were. But if a um, man were to make some of similar suggestions or literally the exact same suggestion that I had just made, who was definitely not an expert and knew less than me, that was welcome, but my comments weren't. Um, that was challenging, and so I was kind of concerned about considering this as a career. Um, so anyway, I did a lot of research, and there are a lot more articles talking about it as an issue that made me feel more welcome because it's something that there is a level of self-examination that's taking place within the community. That felt like a door. Um, the Iron Yard and Smashing Boxes, uh, Lindsay here works there. They have uh, done an amazing job on their website talking about supporting women, and they don't just pay lip service to it. They offer scholarships, and I'm a Women in Technology recipient, a scholarship recipient, um, which I'm very grateful for. We wouldn't have been able to do this otherwise. Um, and so I'm seeing people investing in women, and that helped me uh, yet another door being opened. Um, some of the articles are saying it's not just about getting the women there, but um, creating a space where they're welcome and it's a safe and not a mm -hmm. uh, bad environment for women to be in where side comments or like the baked inness of sexism that is in our culture uh, isn't even necessarily always overt or purposeful or at an individual, but sort of just part of our culture. Um, Clinton, actually, if I can say this, I hope you don't mind. Um, one of our students uh, made a comment on one of his commits that had the word bitch in it, and um, he, it was very innocuous and, you know, just trying to inject some humor. But uh, Clinton stopped the class today and said, look, I'm not going to call anybody out, but we're not going to accept that kind of thing. That word uh, is derogatory to women, and we're not going to do that here. So if you're going to keep doing that, I'm going to start to call you out, and we're going to have to actually have a serious discussion. So that's amazing. <laughs> um, so one thing, so not, I would like to talk to you because this group has been very welcoming, right? Definitely, absolutely. I would love to hear your thoughts on like what really. So you've been involved in this group for how long now? So since uh, November of 2010. Right, and so it's not just the talks, so it's a very... Right, so there have been lots of workshops, and everyone has been extraordinarily nice to me, and I definitely haven't felt that you know, people treated me any differently from, the, from any of the male members here. It's, it's been great, I mean, and I've learned a lot. So I could definitely yeah. spend more time learning things, but, <laughs> but um, yeah. it's been wonderful. Yeah, so that's right here, this particular group right here, to be involved in this group right here. So that would be definitely one one starting point for mentorship, Absolutely. right? And getting that support, so that's great. One of the questions that, that's been interesting to me is, is what's the, what? how do you feel is different in your interactions with other developers, especially male developers, in the open source world mm -hmm. versus the closed source business world, perhaps. Like if you work for a company, what's the difference between working with open source developers and working with corporate developers? I, I don't have a 
have a lot of experience actually work I work for a business but our entire business is based on open source so <laughs> it's kind of hard to yeah. say so I actually like to point out what May was saying over there which is everything is everything is visible you can see what's going on if somebody's calling someone out Karen putting her name on an actual commit you know things like that just everything is completely available for everyone to see, right? So we hear about these, like someone mentioned Twitter blowups and all these things, so it's completely open. So that's the difference is because it, there's visibility to these things, right? Lots and lots of visibilities, so that's what I see. So there's no, like, stepping into the manager's office and I, yeah. doing dealing with like I mean, it's that. good and bad, right? Because it's transparent, absolutely. But certainly, again, I live in the Ruby world, which is renowned for having a, I mean, there's, there are websites dedicated to the Ruby drama. There, I think there's an actual rubydrama.com. Don't let that be your project. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so on, you know, in, you know, in the closed source world, they, the manager, you know, someone could take you in their office. And, you know, there, there are consequences. In the open source world, they love that rock star. Rocks, rock star thing, right? And so uh, members, people who are on core teams of famous frameworks get, they read their press, and then their heads get big. And that can lead to um, un, I don't know, behavior that your mom might not let you get by with. <laughs> right? And so it works both ways. It's, it's nice because everything is visible, but at the same time, there's no cap on anyone's behavior. And so, you know, the, uh, so Clinton, I'm sorry, I, like. Oh, I, I just wanted to point because it is very visible, but um, there's more than one study I've seen that shows that the percentage of women in open source is actually much less than the percentage of women that were in open source. Yes. Mm -hmm. so tiny. I don't have any insight to that. I just thought that was interesting. I didn't hear everything that you said on the end. Could you repeat that? Oh, I said, I've seen yeah. several studies that indicate the number of women in programming in the open source mm -hmm. world is actually significant. Mm -hmm. And what do you, you think that is? I don't have any insight. In your own opinion from working, because I know, okay, I know I'm kidding you, but. <laughs> 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 so so the thing obviously is, being an open source programmer and probably everyone in this room being at a trial meeting has some feelings about, you know, well, open source is great and, and open source is a different, different thing. But, um, <laughs> but, but I mean, the, the open source world is a much more informal world. There's a lot of stuff being done at work. There's a lot of stuff being done out of work. Um, there's a lot of uh, strong, strong personalities attract people to projects. Um, and so my guess, if I had to guess, which it would be wrong because it's just a guess, is that within the uh, closed source world, uh, most of that's taking place in a business place, and so there's a level of professionalism that comes with that. And the um, open source community is more of a bazaar, so to speak. In <laughs> um, several spellings of that word. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, a, it's a much more organic and much more folk structure, which enables, or unfortunately allows people to hide in there, allows people to do things that they wouldn't do in a business setting, allows people who have a strong personality yeah, to fine. use that in a certain way. But again, that's a big wild guess that's probably not right. I just want to toss it in your opinion. I think it, I'll bet you that contribution, the number of commits you have on GitHub, GitHub is directly related to how much free time you have. Yes. 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 <laughs> I forgot, I've read about that. That is yeah. exactly what yeah. I mean. Yeah. I mean, women work something like half, as, half again as many hours as men if you consider family responsibilities, disproportionate involvement in childcare, just plain having to work more hours in some cases because of income issues. So if you put stuff like that, if you put put your GitHub repo on your job application, you're driving women off. Yes, you absolutely are. Like take take that under advisement when you do it. You're telling me if you don't have free time to work on open source outside of your day job, we don't want you here. That's the message I get. Wait, right? repeat that again. I'm saying if you ask for GitHub repos on job applications, many women don't have serious open source contributions. And so what the, the message they hear is that you're saying if you don't have enough free time right now to contribute to open source on top of all the other jobs that you do, we don't want you here. And it will keep women from applying. 
there are other ways to find out. Like, is every competent programmer out there have a busy GitHub account? I should, I should look at mine. I'm, I think I'm a really good programmer, but my GitHub sucks. Right? So you wouldn't get me. I would never apply for your job. The other thing with that is that even if you are involved, some projects like say WordPress aren't hosted on GitHub, right. Right. so um, that can also that can be a barrier. But I definitely felt the double shift thing. So I don't have kids, so I have more free time than I otherwise would. But because I have a full time job and because I do work in the community, I organize girl development. I do all this stuff. I work a lot of hours outside of work uh, in the tech world, but none of it shows up on GitHub unless yeah, you count exactly. my class slides. So when I see those applications that are like. Oh, you know, put your GitHub repo. I'm like, oh, well, um, I move on because I know that it's. And there are ways to manage that. I mean, and and I mean, I don't want to stray too far into how to write your job description. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I I do think there's something very valuable about you know not. I, I think the whole sort of show your GitHub thing for jobs started as a reaction to only your professional history counts. And people saying, hey, you know, I do all this open source work, it, w it should be recognized as equally valid. And that's a really good thing. And that is something that people, as a side project or outside of their normal job skills or whatever, can build skills and get involved and build contacts and all that. But at a certain point, it's, you know, when it evol evolves into your GitHub, re, you know, your GitHub account is your resume. Is you. Is you. That's the only thing that matters. You know, you know, fill in as a required slot on this application. You know, your latest thing. Then you become instead. Then it becomes just as focused on here's the only path. And I think for any kind of diversity effort, mm -hmm. not only for right. for women. Right. I was just going to mention. But that. for people from other parts of the world, mm -hmm. people with different economic circumstances, people with right. different career paths, right. you can't sort of just say, my particular world, my particular little tiny fraction of the world mm -hmm. is the only valid path. Mm -hmm. And I think that applies no matter who you're trying to open things up to. The sense of privilege, yeah. right? Being able to do that, so we've all so is there any other? Yes. Nice. Yes. Um, would saying something like uh, portfolio is welcome or something more general, could that sure. be like yeah. a good, I guess, sort of standing? I, or even saying something like, you know, we know you might, we, we know that you might not have time to have open source, but if you do, you can show us that. Yep. That's cool, right? Yep. Like acknowledging that that's not something that everybody has is a huge thing. Right. Saying we'll respect it and we'll consider it, but it's not a hard requirement, opens up a lot more flexible opportunities. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or maybe maybe ask like what else they're interested, you know, what other interests they have and things like that, and see you know, mm -hmm. what you know what else they could put on there as opposed to that. Mm -hmm. Which may be something completely non-technological. Yeah. I would say instead of asking for the GitHub resume, ask the question that you're trying to ask. Which is so if if, the, if which depends on what your organization is. If your question is, are you involved in open source software? Because we're an open source software company, and that matters a lot to us. Ask, how are you involved in open source software? If your question is, are you involved in the tech community? Ask, how are you involved in the tech community? If your question is, can you program your way out of a white paper bag? ask for code samples or for a portfolio. Um, to just think about what the GitHub question is asking rather than using it as a shorthand, I would say. And if you're asking, do you work on code 18 hours a day even when you're outside of work, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> if you're asking, do you want to come and do that for us? Really? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um. I just want to quickly reintroduce myself as a member of the Cloud Steering Committee, uh, Michael, and in, invite either ideas uh, right now or maybe after the fact through any means that we're obviously very interested in this topic, why we're, part of why we're here tonight, um, but generally I think Cloud has been, for me, a tremendous resource to learn from going like zero skills, I just kind of like, interested in this stuff, to a job and a career. Um, we're generally interested in, in helping people do that sort of thing. And we're doing rather poorly with like half the population. So 
awesome to see so many people here, uh, a lot more diversity tonight. Uh, we want to know how we can continue that like beyond just tonight. I, I would hate to see uh, so many people leave tonight and think, oh, that was really interesting, and then just not come back. Um, let, me, let me ask you a question. Please. Yes, uh, you have to be a member of Trilog, okay. which is free. There are membership forms up there. Uh, all I have to do is fill one out and, and turn it in and come back to another meeting in the future and collect your membership card, and, and that's it. You're in. Okay. What uh, are the responsibilities of uh, the steering committee? The responsibilities of the steering committee, we meet approximately weekly uh, online uh, for like about half an hour, talk about logistics, upcoming meetings. Uh, we do things like find rooms, uh, find speakers, find panelists, interesting topics put together workshops, but the most important thing is trying to identify what new things can we do that we're not doing right now to help people get involved in open source stuff. I can tell you what to do. Please. Here's what works, right? There's research about this. Again, I suck at attribution, but I read all of it. Here's the thing that happens. So a uh, women come in and uh, this is not representative, right? If a woman comes to try love, probably there are many more men than women. And so you come in the door, and even if everybody's really nice, you, there's a very strong cue that it's not the place for you. Make a mailing list, get their email address, and invite them back. There's a lot of data that says that works, right? Get their email address. So I'll say it again. So there should be a piece of paper going around right now. Membership no, don't do that. <laughs> don't. We're not trying to get it. Like, like Julie wants them on the whatever it is steering committee, but I don't. Nobody wants to be on the steering committee that isn't even trying to speak. Yeah, I would not speak for everybody. She might. Those are just yeah. members. Yeah. They they, we're not even trying to get them to join now. We're just trying to get them to come back. Yeah. Right? Is this let's, take, let's take that step. And the way you get them to come back, you don't ask them to come out here and fill that thing out. They're not going to do it. You need to send them personal email before the next meeting with their name on it, not a mass mailing. Everybody gets an email. Like, if you want women here, here's how you, this works, right? Send them email and say, tell me your name. Osio. Osio. Osio, please come back. There you go. We want to see you at the next meeting. You ask them one at a time. And if you do that, women will come, and then they'll join, and then someone will be on the stream. I would even right? say that having to fill, that, that fill out a membership form yeah. is do a bit of a... Walk around and ask for their email address. Yeah. It's not that hard, really. Right? You would do it. You Great. want to know. That's what works. I, yeah. invite, I will make that happen after yeah. the meeting. I will find awesome. the paper and play. And incidentally, the very same thing works if you are trying to run a conference and trying to get women to. One thing we hear a lot in organizing conferences is we would love to have more women speaking at our conference, but none of them apply. Ask people to speak at your conference. I would say. Ask that. people to teach your class. Ask people to apply to your job. I would say you, know? you even have to do that at Girl Development, and it's a women's group, and like 90% of our membership is female. But when we have events and we we have better luck, and we specifically ask people, hey, you've been at Code and Coffee, you're really awesome. Right. We want you to come talk right. at our thing. And the answer is usually yes. It's a matter of being welcomed. I'd say one other thing with open source is if you're trying to encourage women or diversity or newbies in general, stop stealing all the easy bugs. <laughs> <laughs> So we had a, a, my one success story of hiring a woman, um, we had courted her seriously for six months before she would even mm -hmm. consider taking a job with us. Mm -hmm. um, 
how do we... I mean... Was it worth it? Yes. Was she worth that effort? Yeah. She was. She was phenomenal. Um, so you went like through... You, you courted the amazing senior woman, not the loser, slacker, beginner woman. She's an MIT grad. She yeah. had, you know, she's working at Google now. Uh, she's... <laughs> uh, anyway. Well, that's good. Um, that's yeah. Good. She actually... So if you have a Chromebook, she built it. Like, she built the software that runs it. So that's... <laughs> Um, but I, like I want to know. I how, feel awesome. I love your math. How, <laughs> I want from a. So hiring guys was a lot easier. Just what? because. Oh, just because there's more of them? Well, no, because I just post a job and they say they come flocking, right? Yeah. yeah. So they don't I, don't. I don't post a job and women come flocking. I there's don't know research why. about that too, right? Like, but. Um, you know, I, know, I know a new book for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the title is, is there's research in <laughs> assuming that women are underconfident and men are, men are the right amount of confident, really the truth is, you know the truth, right? Men have, a, men, men have, some, men have an, ex, an elevated idea of their own confidence, and women are very accurate. And actually, I, I, I think that's probably There's true. data to support you. Yeah. I, I knew a woman in California who ran a, from one of those, in San Fran, in one of those startups, right, who, who was in person at all. And she never saw uh, uh, resumes for women. They never got to it because they were being filtered out at the front. And so what she finally did was she went to the people who were taking the resumes and she told them, how come I don't see any resumes for women? And they're like, well, none of them are qualified. And, and she was like, how do you know they aren't qualified? And they're like, well, look, they're shaking resumes at her. The men are so much more qualified than the women. And she said, no. And, and finally, she just told people, give me every resume from a woman who applies for a job, no matter what it says. That's, that's what she had to do to get, like, because the guys were so overinflated, it wasn't like they knew that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> they were speaking out, putting it on their resumes, yeah. and the women were being totally penalized. And so as a female, you either have to decide whether you're going to do something that feels like lying, Right? It feels to me like lying. Oh, like you have to get a guy to write your resume, which is <laughs> I get other people to write my bios for talks. Right? I can't bear it. But but so you just just be careful about that, right? Like it might be that you should just look at every. You, you well, should get I work for a startup, so nothing yeah. is filtered. I get yeah. it. <laughs> so I we post jobs on Stack Overflow and. Right. Yeah. yeah. We have some. We have some other people. I'll just want to because I think the reason why it's true is that um, both set sociopaths are men, <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and the, this is actually narcissists. That's a very narcissist. Yeah. Personality disorder. And, and what she said exactly is, is scientifically accurate. Mm -hmm. Men will significantly overvalue their own skills, and I have seen resumes for men applying for IT jobs. Mm -hmm. where they just had no concept of reality whatsoever. We just have to know that. Well, I've known Lenore for what, 20 years, and I've been trying to work with you for 10. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> We have classes. <laughs> Once I realized that they don't really know what they're talking about, that's when I started getting my confidence. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, okay, I can talk. Like, you, you can talk whatever, right. but I don't really hear right. what you're talking about. I'm mm -hmm. providing some actual facts. So, so we keep talking about this, and it's something that's popular, and it has a sense of failure, right? A sense of failure, like, uh, you know, and anticipatory, and, and just risk, risk yeah. effort for you know, mm -hmm. things like that. But I don't know. I, that's not something I, I kind of dive in head first. And I feel like a lot of women on this panel probably do the same thing. And and you know, but I'm wondering how maybe some other women would feel. You know, this fear of taking a risk or jumping in and diving in and just saying, hey, whatever, I'm going for it. Um, one thing that sort of has helped me is like not thinking of stuff as a mistake, but just like an opportunity to learn. I mean, if you do mess up or whatever, it's right. not bad. Sorry. It's not a bad thing. It's like you can just learn from the mistake. Mm -hmm. And then 
Yeah. It's a problem a lot of us have. Yeah. Right. <laughs> That's right. Totally. So let's say we're all super inspired and want to go change the ratios of women in open source. What's your Start like? a trilog. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> or another project, what's your recommendations for people who've never done open source before, but we're really inspired, we're going to go home, we're going to spend an hour on it, what's the one thing I should do? Find a project that either you are passionately in love with, or you already really dig the community. Right. Because if you are trying to get into a project, no matter how good a programmer you are, no matter how experienced a programmer you are, no matter if you've been doing this since 1973, you are still a newbie when you start that project. You still do, you don't know their particular culture. You don't know what bug tracking tool they use. You don't know what source code, what their source, their code writing style is. You don't know what they're using for source control, all of that. You have to learn all of that. Um, if you're just gonna kind of pick a project out of the trees, or the air, or the orifices, <laughs> and, huh? That one, yeah. Um, and just say, I'm gonna do that one, you are going to run into some kind of wall and it's going to be frustrating, you're gonna feel like the idiot and the newbie and the person who makes all the mistakes. Um, if you have, a, you know, if you have something that's gonna motivate you to get involved in that particular project, whether it's crosswords or, you know, I love that story by the way. <laughs> you know, that, that sort of mythical scratching the itch or if it's, you know, a community that you already know is really supportive and great. I, I've, I've worked with a couple projects just because the community was so dedicated to sort of being welcoming to new, com new participants and people who were just getting started that it was worth it, worth writing Perl just to work with them, right? <laughs> really? <laughs> Very brief. I got about two patches on that project and then I had to give up. <laughs> I um, tried Perl once. But yeah, you know, it's, it's like, if there's something that can kind of motivate you to stick with it through the really rough stuff, but also know that every project is gonna have the rough stuff. You know, it may be that you pick a project that looks really great, but they still use subversion. You know, and you can't stand subversion. You either suck it up or you find another project, but you, you kind of have to know that you're gonna have to work through that stuff one way or another. So find something you love. I would start even before that. Like, I would use open source. I would just find something I yeah. want to do. Good point. I would find something I want to build, and I would go find tools to build it. Mm -hmm. And those tools are likely going to be open source, and then that will pull you toward that community. Then you'll want to get on the mailing list, you know, in the news groups. Then you'll want to maybe go to a conference. Then you'll meet some people. Then you'll see some talks. Then you'll, right? It goes on and on and on. Like, like you, you can't just invite yourself into these communities, you, yeah. you, right? You work your way. You break in. Right. Yeah. 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 It's like any other kind of community. Right? So like, go make something. Yeah. And thank That's you for you calling me on that, because that was like, I was starting on step four. And nope. you got well, to because you're, you've been on step four for so long, you forget, <laughs> right? right? I mean, that's what it is. Yeah. That's but if you're not an open source now, you, you don't just go start making yeah, contributions to an open source project. Like, like you want, like the web is cool, build something on the web, right? The splat space is cool, right? Does anyone know what splat space is? Somebody brought that up. Okay, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Splat space is a hacker space for makerspace in downtown Durham. It's basically a nerd consortium. <laughs> and it's in, uh, in the, the snow building, uh, which is uh, in, in uh, the basement of Below View Cafe. And basically, uh, we have uh, meetings uh, every Tuesday nights at 7, and software project nights every Sunday night at 6 p.m. Plus lots of other meetings and lots of other organizations be there. But there is stuff about uh, writing software and 3D printing and um, just just about any uh, you know geeky thing you can think of. And let's say if you went to Maker Fair uh, this weekend, um, then you will enjoy Splatspace. Thank you. 
Is there a cost associated with it? Uh, so uh, basically meetings are open to anyone. If you want a key, which would allow you uh, 24 by 7 access, then you would pay $50 a month. Or if you're a student, it would be $20 a month. Cool. Awesome. Um, we have a meeting on Monday, Technoactive is third Monday, so it's at Splat Space. If y'all want to go, digital rights, you know, <laughs> NSA, we're going to have to So if you want to go hang out with people that are slightly paranoid, I'll be there, yeah. <laughs> awesome, that sounds great. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, cool. I think we're actually at time. So I want to give a very big thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>